a New York staple, and she's known throughout the world, but to go out, born and bred here in New York City, she actually is one of the best point guards in uh, play at St. Bonaventure. Um, St. Bonaventure. Uh, I didn't go to this. Um, I want to bring to the stage the court of Priscilla Evans. Alright, IQ, 
aka field of the game, and forward. So take a moment right now and think about your team. And I want you to think about where they lie from number one to number 13, or how many people you have on your team. Where they lie in those areas. And if you're not really sure, I implore you to do this next week or whenever you have them in the gym. Take them through a 30 to 45 minute pace on just skill. Meaning the basics. Have them run through layups with the left and right hand. Have them just basic passing, chest pass, bounce pass, skip pass, drift pass, pass to the left, pass to the right, post entries. Have them taking basic stepping jumpers, right? Have them explain to you their reasoning after you guys play pick up with some of the decisions they made. And as you're kind of going through these things, you can chart them too. Chart how many shots they're making. If they're, if they're taking 20 shots, how many do they make? They're taking 10 layups to the left, right, how many do they make? And as you're looking at these numbers, if you're noticing that your players are missing a, a great deal of those shots, or those percentages are not where they need to be, then I would implore you to completely scrap your practice plans, right, and prioritize you. Because as you guys are putting together your game plans for this year, your offenses and your flex screens and your ball screens, they all require skill. And if you don't have the personnel or the players who are skilled enough to even dribble, then how are they going to run your ball screen offense? So a lot of times when we think about developing and, and, and getting players ready for the next level, we think about, oh, well, I can go and have this, or I can run this, or that's a great screen, or this is a great out-of-bounds play. But can you have someone who can rebound the basketball? Can you have someone who has the IQ or the understanding, or even understands the reads of what they're looking for as they're coming off of these screens or, or making these passes? And if you can start from there, right, and now prioritize your practice accordingly, I think you can get a lot further in terms of the goals that you're setting, which is winning championships, winning games, or you know, developing players into all Americans, or whatever it is that you're trying to do. Right, so does that make sense so far? So I talked about those five areas that we're gonna go on. I'm trying to get through as many of them as possible, um, but if anything else, trying to teach you some concepts or, or share some concepts that I felt would work for me. And when you talk about those five areas, the next thing that I do is I break them down into three stages. And yes, I'm a Virgo and I'm super listy, so there's gonna be a lot of listening going on here. So the three stages of laying that foundation to me are the teaching phase, this is just where you're introducing the concept or the skill to them, right? So if we're talking about ball handling or ball control, you're teaching them, all right, these are the different types of dribbles. And I'm talking about even on the college level, we go this basic, right? We teach them efficiency of dribble. These are how many dribbles it should take to get there, right? We teach them the purpose of the dribbles, right? This is when you use your back dribble. Because we assume a lot of things when it comes to basketball. We assume that players know way more than they, they actually do, right? Sometimes when you start to address these things, then you realize that they didn't know what a back to was, you know? So the teaching phase, the second thing is going to be the rep phase. And that's the phase that, that encompasses reps of the shot, so the skill, right? And then also it, it encompasses just the technique. You get down to really showing them this is where your foot should be. Right? This is where the ball should be. This is why the ball should be here. And you rep it, and you rep it, and you rep it until it becomes second nature to them. And then the third part of that is the live phase. Right? This is when we put them in the situation to do it against defense. And sometimes it's structured, sometimes you just roll the ball out and say, go, figure it out. Right? But in that phase, you're hoping that the teaching and the reps, now they're able to apply it to a live situation. Okay, so when I go through the different workouts that I do with even our players or when I was coaching high school or I was coaching different groups of people, I never ever felt like one phase was done. So just because you're doing things live doesn't mean that you forget about the teaching and reps. You always have to go back to it if it's not where it needs to be. In practice right now, literally, we work on the same things every day, probably 101 ways, but it's to accomplish the same thing. Getting in their brain exactly what they need to do, how they need to do at what pace they need to do it, and how to do it against defense or to the rest when people are trying to take the ball. Right, so when we talk about ball control and we talk about passing, let me get 
three volunteers, preferably folks that are still <laughs> <laughs>
there's way more talking, there's way more sprinting to spots, right? There's way more aggression when we're attacking the paint, right? But based on the level where you guys are at, there's different things that you may be, may be emphasizing, right? So that you want them to do. Maybe they're not doing, maybe they're not moving the first time around because you want them to just focus on being still and being ready. All of that is up for interpretation, all of that is up for what matters to you or what you're prioritizing at the moment. And with the understanding that you can always build up and progress as they pick up and progress what you're doing. Okay, so right now we're going to two dribbles. How many? Two dribbles. Right, we're going to start this way with it. Here we go, first of all, snap it, snap it, from behind. Two, two, two.
in girls' basketball. How many times, especially in New York, do you go to a, you know, a game or West Fork and it's go, 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 running people over left and right? That's how we get charges. That's how we get charges. <laughs> That's how we get them. to the charge drill, right? <laughs> but they're just running people over left and right. So we talk about pivoting, we talk about jump stopping, getting players to understand and read, right? There's multiple ways to pass. Not all of them have to be off the pool going 90 miles per hour with no control. So every time that we're doing this drill, we might do it when we're passing it off the dribble. We might do it when we're jump stopping every time. We might do it when we're jump stopping and pivoting at least twice every single time. So that they're getting it in their mind that you have options when you get into the paint. You don't have to force a shot. You don't have to run people over, right? And if you're patient enough, three seconds may seem like it's quick, but it's a ton of time. Someone will get over for you if you pivot, because that allows them to see you. Right? So emphasizing, jump stopping, pivoting in girls' basketball, if you don't, it's something that's so important. What do you got? Everybody's happy. 
from, slide that over to the corner from this type of setup, a power triangle, however you want to do it, right? If you're doing a lot of wall screens, rolls and posts, then it can be a quick, quick thing when she's coming up, she's setting the wall screen, right, rolling down. You can have a quarter person lift and now work that enter and then go through the same options. But whatever you do, however you play, you have to make sure that you equip your players with the multiple ways that they can accomplish what you want, which is getting it inside. Right? Any questions with that so far? Any thoughts with that? Any disagreements with that? I'm up for disagreements as well. Be good? What we got? Thank you. 
contact for your level. It's a, a key piece of advice because we exploit the rules of contact for fouling when you're facing up to when you're back to the basket are different at our level. So we teach every position to understand. If you come off a flex cut, let's say, and you're back to the basket, exploit those contact rules. If you catch off the block and face up, exploit those contact rules. Somebody touches you twice, if somebody puts two hands, it's a different type of foul. So now you're digging into their strategy quicker. So it's very important, high school, AAU, college, know the contact rules for your level. Absolutely, great point. And the other part about that is also know your players. This may not work for everyone, right? Development and, and, and skill and things like that is not a one size fit all type of formula. So when we go back to that foundational piece of what type of player are you, right? You might have some players on your team that can operate down low and mix it up and be on the perimeter, but again, you want to play that way where people are positionless or things like that, assess how you are developing them to do so. And if they're not being put in a position when you're doing passing drills, if your forwards are never out here making those passes, right, then it's going to be really hard for you to run things where they're forced to do so come game time. Right? So again, it's assessing your team, assessing where they're at, and then also prioritizing, do I have enough time to get people playing the way I would like them to play. And having that flexibility to know that if that's not the case, then where can I put them to where they're not in positions doing things they're not comfortable Because that's the other part of it, and I got you, I see you, but that's the other part of it. When you go to, out in July, right, to kind of go back to that, is so you don't see post entries. But then you also see the frustration of players not getting the ball and then trying to do things that they're not good at and not having success. So now we're watching them and saying, oh, this kid's shoot these threes, and not that she wants to show versatility, but it's not what she's, she's good at. And the more that you guys as coaches can get players to buy into what they're good at right now, while working on the things that they're not great at, right, the better that they can go out and actually showcase their strengths instead of showcasing their weaknesses because they feel like they have to do something and they're not getting the ball. Does that make sense? Um, Mark, how about the time? Oh, so. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit more about some development. I borrowed you, so we're good. Let me get a guard. Y'all here? Good. All right, so let's talk about guard development, right, and a few things. The one thing is that when we talk about those five areas, let's, let's talk about finishing. Okay? Finishing is so important, right? The ability to finish players. Now, you have players in your team that are better finishers other, but everybody can at least be baseline decent finishers. One thing that I, I, I would implore you that if you don't do to consider is to develop finishing series for your players. By position, right? By location on the court. What do I mean by that? So if I have if I have Cindy here and I know Cindy is my point guard, right? I'm gonna give her a series of finishes that work for her. It can be anywhere from four to eight finishes that we work on that she knows she's going to be able to, to, to use and utilize against the defenses that she faces. So for Cynthia, we start basic. I'll say your finishing series is off one, off two, right? Off two with the shot fake, right? Inside hand finish, reverse, and then some type of shot that she creates off the pivot. Now I give her those finishes not just because they sound good. I give her those finishes because as I watch her and watch film, I noticed that those were the finishes that she was getting based off what defenses were giving her. 
perfect example. She's super fast in passing lanes. She's constantly getting steals. So her finishing to the basketball court is something that she's asked to be able to do, left and right. Right? We talk about all two. Cynthia's not the biggest, but she's going in the trees. So the purpose of all two is the shot baby. We talk about using the inside okay. hand. Specifically, if she's attacking from the, the corner spots, so she's attacking, she's got the ball in the left hand, the defense is recovering, right? So now she uses that inside hand, which would be her right hand, right, to, to prevent her shot from getting blocked. Okay? She can do that off of one foot, she can do these finishes off of two feet, right? The same concept goes with reversing the ball. So now she instead of that defense, she's taking one. They have another floater. 
the face-up series. I'm going to bring Yaz back out here real quick. So that's a perimeter-based finishing series, right? When we talk about a post-based finishing series, we're going to go through some options of what we do in the post. That's a face-up series. So the first thing that happens is every time that she catches the ball, we want her to step to meet the ball. So Yaz is starting on the block, which we like. Every time the pass comes, she's stepping to meet the ball on two. We want to both be Even the best defenders, if you are solid. 
kick it back out, be close again, you get it quickly score. Right? So as much as you equip them with, and it's not something we're doing once a week, this is something we're doing every single day. This is literally how we warm up in practice when we do pre-practice. All right, forwards down here, or guards that can post down here, and we run through it all the time. We do it in individuals, we do it in group sessions, we do it post-practice, we do it when they have extra shooting. But trust and believe, every single player that comes in, they travel at first. Their feet are a little off. They, they, they pivot the wrong way, you know, or they pivot the opposite way. But when you stick with it and you do it every day, it becomes habit and it becomes second nature to them. Thanks so much, I appreciate that. All right, any questions with that so far? Any questions with that? Anything, anything, as we rattle off. I know I had 20 minutes like 20 minutes ago. What you got? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to put an emphasis on how you're teaching the post and everything. And People forget, like, you know, last year's national championships in Delhi, they didn't score a single three in the, in the final game. Absolutely. They played through their post players. And everybody goes about how, like, you know, the game is changing and three-pointers, but I think if you play your type of basketball, whatever that is, and if you do it right, you can be successful. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, right? See, sometimes you just got to stay true to, to what works for you. And, and going back to that point, it's just personnel. You have really good post players one year, you know, and really good guards the next year, then what does it make sense to do, right? You're probably going to shift things a little bit, but, you know, you, you got to be able to be adaptable and know that you got to play to the strengths of your team. You know, you got to get, get players to play to their individual strengths, you know, while also helping them to grow and get better at the things that they're not great with. But there's going to be some players that just never are going to excel at things. Like, after a while, I'm just going to be say by soft, end of sophomore year, if you, you're not hitting threes, like, about it. <laughs> okay. yeah. You know, like so many times too, we get caught up on like, oh, we gotta make them good shooters. Like, yeah, they gotta shoot. They gotta do. Sometimes it's overload. If you have players on your team right now that are really, really athletic and raw, just get them really good at attacking the ball and good at rebounding. There'll be a spot for them at a high level, right? We'll work out the rest of the stuff, but we just want to see what are you good at, right? What do you do exceptionally well, consistently? So instead of getting a player who they have all these areas that they're okay with, really lock into what they, they're really good at or solid at and enhance that, right? And allow them to understand that they can just excel at that, you know, and, and the rest will take care of itself. Sometimes it can be overloaded if, if you try to get them good at too many things. Any other chat? Um, so we're talking about the six categories. Yep. Um, it can mean a lot of things. Um, to be honest, 
take a player with a higher IQ um, than a player who's just like naturally athletic or raw or anything like that. Because when because you get to games, more. right? Yeah, because when you get to games, uh, your your athleticism can easily be neutralized if you're not skilled, you know, or you don't have a high IQ. So for us, IQ is a lot of things. IQ is just an understanding of, of like your game first and foremost, like what you do and what you do well. You know, players that can understand like, okay, I just missed four threes in a row. I should probably not take the fifth. You know, like let me do something else or get my player, my teammates involved. IQ are players, when we have that first conversation with them on the phone, um, I always engage them in a basketball talk. You know, like, so you watching any college basketball, you watching any, like, what kind of basketball you watching? You watching NBA? And beyond the surface level conversation of, yo, I love LeBron or Kyrie's handles are crazy. Like, talk to me more about basketball. You know, like, how do you envision yourself? Like, I always ask players, what do you think is the best part of your game? And they'll be like, oh, I can shoot it, I can pass it, I can, I can, like, um, I can do things, I'm good. You know, and it's just like, as a basketball player, you should know what you do well. And you should be able to articulate that to anyone who asks. And then you should be able to go on the floor and actually show them, right? So their understanding of themselves and what they're good at, um, players that actually watch the game. And girls basketball, and it's unfortunate, a lot of girls basketball players don't watch basketball. No. More and then they, even more importantly, they don't watch the level that they aspire to play. So there's so many girls who aspire to play college basketball that don't even watch women's college basketball. And so it's like if you're asking them questions about like, do you prefer to play up tempo, half court, you know, what do you want to play in? They can't answer that because they just play and then they clock out. You know, so for us, IQ are players who watch the game, players who can understand decision making. Like statistically, turnovers and, and the amount that they have is a great indicator of their IQ because they understand, you know, where they should go, where they should go how deep they should drive, you know, they understand the right types of passes they should make. They understand who not to pass it to, right? So you gotta have an understanding and an idea of the game to know that I'm not gonna put this girl in a bad position by passing it to my 6'5 center at half court and expect her to run the break. You know, like, and they're not gonna look at you like you're crazy when you tell them, like, why'd you pass it to her? Right, so IQ is that. Um, IQ is also, like, just their hunger to get better, too. You know, like, are they, are they trying to do something learning on their own. And when you go to their practices in their open gyms, they're always vocal. And they're not just saying stuff. They're actually saying, like, key points. They're, they're almost saying what the coach is getting ready to say to them. Like, you gotta space the floor out. Or like, you see somebody about to take a crazy shot, and they're like, whoa, 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 read out, read out, read out, read out, read out, read out, read Like, that, those things are IQ to us at that level. We see players that are engaged in the game that way, from, from an analytical standpoint, just an understanding. We know that they either, chances are, their parents are coaches, you know, or they hang around coaches, or they play a lot of basketball. So, kind of answer question. What you got? How do you deal with players that are very high IQ, but very low IQ? Ooh, good question. High IQ and low. He said, how do you deal with players that are high IQ and low IQ? You know, you got to throw them in a lot of situations where they have to figure it out. We have players on our team that are so smart that sometimes they like, they talk themselves out of like everything and, and overthink everything. And so when we're doing workouts with them, it's less me telling her what to do and more figure it out. You just kind of throw them out there like, okay, like this is the goal, find a way. But if I do this, find a way. There is no wrong answer, just do something. And when you put them in those situations where they're uncomfortable and they have to make a decision, eventually they have to make a decision and be okay with that. So we found that kind of throwing them in the fire um, kind of helps them to understand it a little bit more. Just got to make a decision. What's that? Yep. A lot of how do you depict who's a Division One, Two, or Three player um, in transitioning from high school? A lot of times it, it's based on the program and how they play. Because there's a lot of times where there's a player um, maybe it's to be recruited by all Division twos, and then there's a random amount of Division One schools that are looking at her recruiting. A lot of times those schools probably play a system where that kid is a good fit, yeah. you know, so it doesn't matter that maybe she's not as tall as everybody else or not as fast. She just kind of fits because she has something that she does really well that will fit into that system. So if a kid is slow, you know, it may not matter to that coach per se because they may just want her to be a spot up shooter. Right, so the best thing to kind of uh, add to that that you can do when you have a player like that is 
again, getting them to understand you don't have to do or show anything else besides what you're good at, right? Because this school wants you for the fact that you can shoot. So you don't have to listen to everybody that's saying, drive it, show your, show, show your big post game, and, and show me you know, that movie you worked on. The school doesn't want them for all that. The school wants them for the fact that no matter what, they find a way to get their shot, right? So that, that's the whole part of it. When we go to a showcase, like July or May, Yeah. 
the drills or things that you're doing trainer-wise and, and like assistant coach-wise, less is more, right? Think about what you're trying to get them better at and then just think about that player and how you get them to do it. A lot of times it lies in the reps. And a lot of times it, it, it relies, it, it really, really relies on the fact that you don't bend when it comes to details. Um, force communication in all things because there's no college level where you can just play in silence. So when you go, when we go to open gyms and sometimes like literally you can hear a pin drop, I'm like, whoa, well, I don't think this is a division one player here. Because if you're not a player, or especially like guard, the point guard, if you're not or anyone, if you're not a player that's talking, like basketball is not a game that's played in silence. So that's something that you have to emphasize. Sometimes we literally won't say anything in practice just to make sure that they're the ones doing we're not the ones that are on the floor there. So if they're not going to talk in practice, you know, and not talk in games, then why should they play? Right? So force communication, and then you want to make sure that everything that you're teaching and everything that you're doing has a, a holistic approach in terms of that player, making sure that you're, you're, you're loving that player, you're giving that player what they need, you're there for that player, but you're not enabling that player. Right? You're holding that player accountable and making sure that they're doing everything that they can do to get what they say all right. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, I've heard